Star Trek The Next Generation brought us a new Enterprise and a new bridge. This was to be the main setting for much of the drama that followed, all seven seasons of it, and a film. There are a few interesting aspects of this main bridge, not least of all how certain ideas concerning the Nautilus of Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea can be used in relation to it. Roland Barthes once wrote of the liking for ships as being a liking for a finite enclosure, like a child's delight with a tent or a little cabin. It was this wish for a cherished seclusion, rather than a wish to sail into the unknown, that was the source of enjoyment. He argued that the Nautilus was just such an enclosure, but we can also apply this to the enterprise of TNG. Both, after all, had a means of gazing out at the unknown, a window or a view screen. In this video, we will consider the idea, and then, rubbing our hands with glee, we shall explore the main bridge of the Enterprise D. I have taken from my title a paraphrase of Captain Nemo's Porthole, an article in Poetics Today from 1982 by Seaboke and Margolis. They actually consider the semotics of windows in Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes short stories, but using Barth's idea as their lens. Barth expounds his idea in The Nautilus and the Drunken Boat, a short essay to be found in his mythologies. He was writing about the work of Jules Verne, Outside the windows of the Nautilus, the storm raged, but inside the submarine it was warm, cosy and comfortable. There is order inside, safety and comfort, domesticity, tranquility and warmth, as opposed to the disorder and discomfort outside. The salon of the Nautilus was a drawing room full of comfort and artefacts, whilst from the safety of the wheelhouse, Le Cage de Pilote, Captain Nemo steered his submarine. The Nautilus brought together cutting-edge technology with the furnishings of the ideally furnished bourgeois salon. The submarine was both a means of movement and a shelter, like any ship, and the diorama presented by the windows of the Nautilus was echoed by the main view screen on the bridge of the Enterprise. The occupants of both the Nautilus and the Enterprise, particularly the Enterprise D, looked out at the world and universe with wonder. Unlike any ship, the Nautilus and the Enterprise exhibited a rigid system of social control. Born of a liberal ideology, Star Trek may well have been, but the Enterprise was not a democracy, and for good reason. As Q said, it's dangerous out there. Enterprise D was the most comfortable and even luxurious of all the ships seen in Star Trek, comparable to a hotel. Wall to wall carpets, lounges, a bar, even some wood finish. And all of it contained in a warm and well lit environment. Holodecks awaited those wishing to get away from the daily grind and indulge in fantasy. And who knows, perhaps in the Enterprise's undoubtedly well-stocked 24th century library, there was a copy of The Winds of Winter. The main bridge was, in effect, a living room. Just as we, the viewer, watched the next generation on our televisions in our living rooms, the Enterprise bridge crew watched events unfold from the comfort of their armchairs in a living room-like environment. It had its armchairs and its big television, and many more people faced that television. It was comfortable, carpeted, and pastel coloured. The history of its design development is rather interesting and I may explore it in a future video. The egg-shaped floor plan made the bridge seem bigger than it actually was, and as the cameras were more often than not positioned forward, facing aft, this longer access was more evident. The separate helm and navigation stations of yesteryear were replaced by a single console dedicated to helming the ship, whilst the other console became Ops, or the Operations Manager. 
dominating the bridge and embracing, if you will forgive the word, the captain's chair was a wishbone-like rail, seemingly made of wood as a sign that the crew was still in touch with their humanity. The bridge looked more advanced than anything that had come before or even since. There was flow, and that flow was towards the view screen. I am sure many of you watching this video noticed a certain particularity of the view screen. But for those who did not, take note of how faces on the view screen were given a three-dimensional aspect every time the studio camera was angled to one side. It was a very nice touch. There was another notable aspect of this bridge. Someone in the comments section of one of my posts pointed out the theatrical nature of the bridge design. I admit having not really thought of that in relation to this particular bridge, but it is true. There was a center stage, a downstage, and an upstage, and even wings. And the view screen, ah yes, the view screen, that formed a proscenium arch. If there is a specific criticism of the design of the main bridge, then it lies with the tactical station. Its location was behind and above the captain's chair. First problem, if the captain wished to face his tactical officer, he had to twist his head and look up. In fact, from the captain's chair, it might not have been possible to see the face of the tactical officer, although without visiting the set itself, it is difficult for me at least to be certain. Someone in the comments section will undoubtedly have the answer. Second problem, the tactical officer would have had to have stood for long periods at his station, as there was no chair or stool to sit on, at least not until Star Trek Generations. In a combat situation, the tactical officer, arguably the most important officer on the bridge aside from the captain, was at risk of being thrown off his feet at any moment. There is also something else to note. Upstage left, we had the doors to both the conference lounge and the head or toilet. We sincerely hope this toilet was very thoroughly soundproofed. Imagine a tense scene on the bridge, the Enterprise face to face with a hostile alien power, when suddenly... What if a member of the bridge crew suffered a sudden attack of the runs, or was constipated, and was making a particularly noisy effort to squeeze one out? Barthes argues that at the heart of Verne's Nautilus and his mysterious island is the idea of appropriation, the gathering of things into the comfortable and cosy enclosure. The Enterprise voyaged and collected things as well, but this tended to be knowledge, seeking out new life forms and new civilizations. The purpose of exploration in the real world is not only to satisfy our curiosity, but also to seek out new resources. The hunter-gatherer searches for new hunting grounds. The oil company searches for new oil fields. The Enterprise fed the curiosity of her crew, making friends and enemies along the way. She landed away teams, and in so doing, the crew were both metaphorically and literally reaching out. This is hardly the behaviour of those who would wish to sit and watch from the comfort of their windows. The Enterprise could not land on a planet herself, and so that crucial final step, completion of the journey, had to be made the old-fashioned way, on foot and in person. The view screen, the window, whether these are fitted to the Nautilus or the Enterprise, they are, for all practical purposes, for watching where you are going. Captain Nemo steered his submarine using his porthole. Captain Picard and his navigator needed to see in what direction they were headed. For all her technological innovation, the Enterprise remained a setting in a television series, and from a visual point of view, a view screen on the bridge of the ship made sense to the audience. It was the Star Trek equivalent of a wind screen. As for Bath's comforts of the bourgeoisie, the Enterprise D was meant to be futuristic, and as we associate optimistic futures with increased comfort and convenience, it was a logical visual expression of this concept.